Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to introduce the definition, the formal epsilon delta definition of a two-sided limit for a function of one variable, it's called f. So I'm going to assume there's a point C, and C doesn't actually have to be in the domain of f. This f doesn't have to be defined at C for this notion to make sense, rather f is defined around C. So what that means is f is defined on some open set containing C. So Okay, so let's let's make a picture here. So you have you have C. This is C plus T, C minus T. Okay, and what this is saying is there's some T probably small enough so that so that the function is defined on in here and on here. And maybe it's not defined at the point C. Okay, so this set is for some t greater than zero. So the function is defined on the immediate left of C, and it's defined on the immediate right of C. Okay, so we need that in order to make sense of what I'm going to say. So we say that limit as x approaches c of fx is l, where l is some other real number, or maybe same real number. So we say this limit equals l if, and I'll write the definition in multiple lines, just to be clear about the parts of the definition. For every epsilon greater than zero, so this is epsilon. There exists delta greater than zero such that for all x in R satisfying what? Hmm? Satisfying x minus c should be not equal to zero so zero less than that just to exclude the point c itself less than delta what do we have we have uh, y is within well y is just f x zero yeah. f x zero Well, fx minus the, the claimed limit is L. L. You're thinking of continuity, which is a little bit, but here we have this less than epsilon. epsilon. Okay, let me now just rewrite, here's the blue one. Well, let me I'll just rewrite these conditions in interval notation. So, what is this saying? x is in what interval? Uh, c plus minus. Actually. So c minus delta to c plus delta, excluding the point c itself. That's what the zero less than tells us, right? It's so telling us x is within a delta distance of c, but it's not including c. Another way of writing this is c minus delta to c union c to are we here? Yes. C plus delta. Okay. So, x is either on the immediate delta left of c or it's on the immediate delta right of c. You can do something similar on the fx side. So, what, what interval is this saying? fx is in what? L minus x, epsilon, L plus epsilon. Great, awesome. So, so, so instead of writing the conditions in this inequality form, you could have written them in this form. So instead of writing this, you could have written this or this. And instead of writing this, you could have written this. So if this statement is true, so the way you read this is you say limit as x approaches c of fx equals l. Okay, so now how do we define? So we define, how do we define the limit? Well, it's the number L for which the above holds. 
So in addition to the course. If it exists, if the if a number L exists, for which now what would you need to, to show in order to show that this, this definition makes sense? Hmm? Oh, I don't think I understand your question. Is, oh, I mean, is, well, no, is true. Okay, so what, what I mean is, uh, what, what I wanted to ask was, what would you need to prove in order to say that, that the, the notion of the limit makes sense? Well, you need to show that, that there's a uniqueness theorem. So it cannot happen that the limit is some number L, and the limit is another number n. So you need to show a uniqueness term. You need to show that if this holds for one number l, it cannot also hold for another number. Once you've shown that, then it would be, then, then you could define it like this. Now, I should say, if, if it exists. So what I'm saying is that there's a uniqueness theorem, which we'll prove some other time, which says that if, if this is true for one number, it can be true for any other number. So this statement is true for at most one value of L. And if there is such a value of L, that's called the limit.